Hi, Bobby here from Lisbon, Portugal. It's Luis, how are you? I'm great, how are you? <laughs> Thank you very much, Bobby. And I just want to confirm also Jean Ferreira. Jean Ferreira is online. Hi, Hello. Bobby. Okay. Uh, Hi, Bobby here from Lisbon. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. We have been discussing the, the ideas regarding the, all this approach on regenerative or ge regenerative or regeneration or regenerative economics. Too much but people we'll have to now you, uh, two of uh, examples yes. that we can have how to implement that, uh, that type of, uh, of regeneration. Bobby, okay. so we would like back, to, right? to learn a little bit more about the experience that you have uh, you uh, at the Savory Institute regarding the implementation and how to, co sit, co sit to on, have really a regenerative economic or regenerative uh, operations. Well, shall I get started? Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, great. Well, let me get my slides up and share the screen. Um, actually, I think I shared my full screen. Let me make sure I'm sharing just the right window. Okay. Do you see just my slides? Perfect. It's on. Wonderful. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. It um, really is an honor to be here today. Um, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to make it in person, um, but I am really grateful for the, the focus on regeneration. Um, you know, I think regeneration, as many in the room would agree, it, it provides so much hope for addressing the root cause of so many of our global crises, whether that's food, water, climate, so much more. Um, regeneration is really the direction we need to be heading in as a global society. Um, specifically, I work in the world of regenerative agriculture um, with an organization called the Savory Institute. Uh, so Savory Institute is an organization that over the years we have trained and equipped over 16,000 farmers and ranchers and pastoralists. Um, we've done that across, uh, you know, all continents of the globe except for Antarctica. Um, and in doing so, we've influenced 22 million hectares of land and begun regeneration there. Um, we do that by teaching what is called holistic management. So. Holistic management is most often associated with a grazing planning procedure. Um, and that's because we work in the grasslands of the world. Grasslands um, are one third of the Earth's terrestrial land mass, five billion hectares. So we see tremendous marginal reaction being able to influence the management and stewardship of these global grasslands. And so within that, we have a grazing planning procedure for livestock called holistic planned grazing. And it's rooted in the fact that large herds of grazing herbivores used to roam across the grasslands of the world. Um, their predators would keep them tightly bunched and moving. Their urine and dung would act as a natural fertilizer on the land, and they wouldn't return to their uh, to that same piece of land really until the above ground plant material and the below ground deep perennial roots had fully recovered. Um, you know, just like the the large numbers of wildebeest uh, herds um, that migrate across Africa or the 60 to 75 million bison that used to roam across North America. Those numbers have since dwindled. Um, you know, grasslands and grazers um, are codependent on one another because they co-evolved with one another over millennia. In this modern era, though, we've domesticated most of our wild grazers. We've killed off most of their predators and we've put up roads and fences and infrastructure that doesn't allow for those natural migratory patterns that once existed. Um, and so because of that, we can't just take a hands-off approach and say, oh, let's let mother nature do its thing. That won't work because there aren't sufficient numbers of predator and prey that cause the behavior dynamics that used to um, bring about the outcomes and the abundance that used to flourish across our global grasslands. Um, there's a lot more uh, to holistic management and holistic planned grazing than I have time to get into today. But essentially, holistic planned grazing matches the available forage on a landscape or in a pasture to the needs of the herd of livestock and the local wildlife. 
Um, and then from there, there is an aspect of planning the timing of your animal movements, saying I'm gonna move them from this pasture now to the next pasture. That timing is dependent on the adequate recovery rates for um, optimal grass species health. Um, just like after you know a hard workout, it's that rest and recovery period where your muscles get stronger, where you get healthier. That's when you recover is the rest. It's really important. Uh, the same thing after a grazing event. After animals are on a landscape, that's a stressor on the landscape. And then you have the adequate recovery after. That's when things flourish. It's this pattern of hormesis where stress followed by rest equals health. We see that across all life forms. Um, essentially, holistic plant graze, grazing is honoring the relationships and patterns that co-evolved in nature. So whether that's predator and prey or grassland and grazer, um, it's doing our best to, to honor these and steward them in the modern context. Uh, and it works wonders for land managers of, of all types. Like I mentioned, we've worked across six continents and trained over 16,000 farmers. So. Um, you know, here are just two examples showing the profound ecological responses that can come from animal impact and appropriately timed recovery periods. Um, the example on the left that you're seeing is a commercial, a commercial ranching operation. Um, and so they are using fencing to control the movement of their animals. Whereas on the right, this is in Zimbabwe um, at the home of Alan Savory. And so this was achieved by herders on foot. So they employ local community members to act as herders. Um, and there's no fencing whatsoever on the ranch. And this is to allow the wildlife that exists, um, you know, the, the African wildlife that's so critically important for their ecosystem. It's giving them the opportunity to roam about you know, because if they were to put up fences there, elephants would trample it down all day, every day. It wouldn't meet the, the needs of the local context. And so they've made the decision to use herders instead of fencing. Um, both of these examples are, are very different climates, soil types, cultures, amounts of rainfall, markets, and more. Uh, but the same underlying principles of grassland and grazer and how they depend on one another still apply. Um, this is an example from the Karoo Desert in South Africa. Um, on the right, livestock are managed conventionally. Um, and what I mean by that is they are set out to pasture and then rounded up at the end of the season. It's really a hands-off approach where um, animals have free access to any grass that they like. And in those situations, what they do is they're going to um, overgraze the most desirable species, the most palatable grasses, and they're going to neglect the less palatable grasses. Ultimately, what that does is it overgrazes some and it undergrazes others killing off all of them and allowing bare ground to take over, which is what we're seeing on that right side of the fence. This is how desertification happens. On the left side of the fence, uh, these animals are holistically managed. So it's the same soils and the same weather here, obviously. It's just two sides of the fence. The only difference is the behavior of the animals. Um, and that has been affected by the management that has been put into place. Um, but I mentioned that holistic management, that the holistic plant grazing is a component of it. Um, holistic management is more than just grazing, which I think some people don't really realize about it. It's really a decision-making framework for managing the infinite complexities of adaptive living systems. There are four planning procedures. I mentioned holistic plant grazing. There's also land planning, which is going over fencing and water and, you know, how do you plan that across your landscape, your infrastructure. We have a financial planning component and then we have an ecological monitoring component, which is um, essentially a way for land managers to have rapid feedback loops to know if the management decisions that they are making on their landscape, if they are moving in the direction that they wish to be going. And that piece right there, rapid feedback loops, is really a core piece of managing complex systems. Um, but maybe I should take a step back and 
talk about complexity for a second. Um, and apologies if this has already been gone over in, in previous talks. It's eight o'clock in the morning where I am in Colorado. So I, I haven't been able to, to tune in to the, the earlier sessions, but um, you know, there's complexity and there's complicated systems. And so in complicated systems, you're most often dealing with um, mechanics. And so say a wristwatch, you can dissect a wristwatch, you can disassemble it, take all the different parts out and know exactly what each individual part does. If a part breaks, you can replace it with a new one. You can design and optimize and know definitively exactly what is going to happen with full predictability if you change something. Complex systems, on the other hand, are infinitely complex. There are so many mechanisms at play that it is impossible to know exactly what will happen if you change something, if you change a variable. And that's because living systems are comprised of nodes rather than parts. So you can't dissect a living system down into small individual parts and then try to replace them and optimize them, which is what most people try to do in agriculture, in business, anything that's comprised of living beings. Um, you can't you can control a complicated system uh, through reductionist thinking, um, but you can't control complex systems because it's comprised of nodes that self-organize and new properties are always emerging. You can't fully predict what's going to happen. So it requires a shift from reductionist thinking, and I think this is what John was talking about in a previous um, session, if, if I know John well enough, I'm sure he got into this, uh, but complexity really requires a more holistic approach. And so that's when you factor in the environmental, financial, social aspects. Um, you know, and agriculture, what we're dealing with is, is fully complex. It's the, the original complex system for us to deal with. And so when people try to control it with reductionist thinking, what happens is unintentional consequences um, inevitably arise. When you try to manipulate and optimize individual parts, it doesn't go as planned. So Holistic management, how do you manage complexity? Well, the first thing is to acknowledge that we don't have absolute control or predictability. Weather changes, seasons change, animals have minds their own, new conditions are emerging every day. So complexity requires more of a cooperative dance with these ever-changing uh, conditions. Um, the first step in holistic management is really looking for patterns and processes. So the patterns of grassland and grazer, of predator and prey, of rainfall distribution and how that affects growing seasons and dormant seasons. Um, and then look at the processes. You know, we look at ecological processes like energy flow, water cycling, mineral cycling, biodiversity, um, and then really pay attention to these and honor these in all the decisions you're making. Um, the next piece, um, we have what's called a holistic context. And I like to think of this as really the North Star. It's saying, where is it that I want to go in life with my landscape, with my business, with my organization? Um, and so it charts you in the right direction, but then you might veer off course because of these ever-changing conditions. And what we do then is we have a set of testing questions. So whenever you're faced with a decision, there are some questions that allow you to stay aligned towards that North Star to make sure you don't get off track. Humans are really good at being impulsive and doing things out of self-interest and we're really bad at planning in the long term. And so this concept of having a North Star and using testing questions to stay aligned to it really keeps people on track for what they really want in life. Um, and then the, the other piece I mentioned is feedback loops. So having the ability to monitor and adjust as necessary. Um, so that's really what we teach to farmers around the world, but it's also how we run our organization. You know, we have a holistic context. We use the testing questions and we're always striving to, to build complexity into our systems and programs. So let's take a few minutes um, and look at what that looks like from Savory's programmatic um, strategy. So the way that we get holistic management out to farmers around the world is through a global network. We're working to get it into global consciousness. And so we have a global network that's nodal, interconnected, diverse, self-emergent, 
We're trying to design our network like an ecosystem, like a landscape. Um, and what this does is it allows us to have savory hubs that uh, we have 54 of them to date. They're all independently owned, independently operated. They work with local farmers and ranchers, so it's more peer-to-peer -peer learning support. Um, and it allows the hubs to adapt holistic management to a localized context. So they can develop unique models for achieving impact in a region um, that allows them to, to really work with folks in, in a way that is creative and necessary in that localized form. Um, from there, we have a land monitoring protocol called Ecological Outcome Verification, or EOV. And so this is the second core methodology that our hubs implement. So they teach holistic management, but then they also go out and do land verification. Um, and what this is, is this is that monitoring feedback loop that I mentioned. Um, it's that's needed for managing complexity. Um, it focuses not just on a single metric of ecological health, but rather looks at a whole host. It takes a holistic approach to landscape health. It's looking at the above ground indicators like biodiversity, amount of bare ground, what does the soil capping look like, what is the canopy cover of the vegetative species. And then it's also looking at the slower to turn over lagging indicators like soil health and soil carbon and microbiology uh, in the soil uh, water holding capacity. Um, you know, so it's looking at both the leading and lagging indicators on different time scales. And then we track those over time so that we know is someone's land getting better or is it getting worse? If it's getting worse, it allows for early intervention and allowing people to course correct. Um, if they're trending in the positive direction, that's great. That means they're regenerating land. And that then leads us into our next program, which is called Land to Market. Um, this uh, Land to Market program basically takes EOV verified supply off of these landscapes and connects it into supply chain partners like brands, restaurants, and retailers. So. When we took a holistic look at our network, we realized that market forces were such a critical component that drive producers' decisions. So by creating markets for products that come from verified regenerating land, we're de-risking the space for anyone that's regenerative curious um, and making it easy for brands uh, to bring these materials into their supply chains. It also allows consumers to align their purchasing power with their values. And so this is just um, a peek at some of the brands that we have involved in our land to market program to date. Um, you know, this uh, says 100 plus brands. I would venture to say we're probably at 200 already, but there's thousands of products in the marketplace. Um, you know, whether you're talking about food, wine, fashion, outdoor industry, we're talking meat, dairy, leather, wool, all of these products come off of grasslands and consumers can now find them in the marketplace. Um, and what this really does for us is this creates an accelerator of adoption for bringing holistic management to the soil surface. Because if we're de-risking that space for producers, they're more likely to move from conventional practices towards uh, regenerative practices like holistic management. Um, and then from there, our most recent initiative is actually a, a new organization. We have just recently founded the Savory Foundation. So um, this is based in Copenhagen. Uh, the Savory Foundation is essentially working with institutional funders, uh, brands, philanthropists, sovereign funds, um, you know, anyone that has climate, water, biodiversity goals, um, and helping them deploy resources in a way um, that allows them to uh, fund large-scale grassland regeneration projects. Um, and that is helpful for us because we can then match the expertise that exists within our global network um, with projects that are at a scale that otherwise wouldn't have been accessible to them. And in doing so, funders are able to build the capacity at the ground level for regeneration. And then we can bring in land to market 
and have the ability to measure the outcomes on the land with EOV and connect that into supply chains. And that then all cycles back through. So our programs really all connect with one another, um, ultimately for the goal of scaling up holistic management at the <laughs> grassroots level. Um, and so that's how we operate as an organization or really a group of organizations because Land to Market and Savory Foundation are separate entities from Savory Institute, but we share the same DNA of holistic management and a holistic context. And, you know, we manage them as a complex um, uh, group uh, of living beings because they are. Um, and every day our strategy and our work get more and more complex, but we always come back to our holistic context to guide us in creating that abundance that we know the planet is capable of. Um, the framework proves itself time and time again to be the right way to handle these ever-changing conditions in the world around us. And it's shown us that managing complexity doesn't have to be difficult. Um, we just need to readjust how we see our role in it. Thank you very much, Bobby. Thank you. From Lisbon was a very good presentation. Thank you. John, be, being one of the, the lucky ones that were in your first cohort of the Regenerative Economic course, I know that you are connected with Alan Savory and you are following closely the Savory Institute uh, uh, job and what they are performing. Uh, a quick comment regarding what uh, Bobby have just uh, shared with us. Yeah, well, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I've been fortunate to, to, to know Alan since about um, 2009, I think it was, and, um, and have, have been, as I mentioned again, literally inspired by the idea of holistic decision making and then the idea that we need to expand that beyond the grasslands and, and treat it as the core um, organizing idea for the entire economy. And it's just been a, it's been a, the, the only thing I'd add to Bobby's terrific presentation is that I've also watched the Savory Institute. I've, I've been fortunate to be on their board for the last 10 years. And I've watched the Savory Institute employ regenerative thinking and regenerative design principles into the organization itself at the culture level, at the creating conditions for health as an organization. So regardless of whether you're in the business of planned grazing or forestry, or frankly, you know, uh, producing oil and gas, an organization is a living system and it can behave in a degenerative way or a regenerative way. And, um, you know, one of our challenges, if you take, you know, technology companies, just as an example, um, uh, you know, Facebook and Google are in a business where their product is highly regenerative or potentially highly regenerative, except their business model is highly extractive and degenerative. So regardless of what activity we're doing in the economy, uh, we need to deploy these same patterns and principles of how life works if we're to end up with the healthy outcomes that we desire. Um, but it's been honestly a, not only a, a privilege, but a, a fascinating journey to watch the Savory Institute over the last 10 years go from, you know, a, a radical idea that relates just to ranchers to now stitching together this, uh, this web of, um, uh, of a new supply chain that is potentially uh, a, um, reaching a scale that's meaningful to these very large consumer brands. And that then will trigger this flywheel of positive, be getting more positive, be getting more positive. So, um, I, you know, that's why I, I love to use it as my case study. It's the most regenerative enterprise I'm aware of. But again, not just because of the, 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 the practices on the land, but because of the way they think about all of the different pieces of the, of the extended enterprise. Thank you. Thank you, John. João, João, Ferreira, the, João Ferreira is part of one of uh, our most innovative uh, companies here in Portugal on the, on the food sector. What, uh, what you can add or comment uh, regarding what we have heard until now, João? Hello, Pedro. Um, nice to meet you all. Very nice presentation from Bobby. Congratulations. 
So in Menos Gonçalves, our holistic context is a little bit different because we don't we have a regenerative agriculture project, but we didn't integrate the cattle yet. So we follow all the other principles, and I think every time we talk about regenerative agriculture, it's very important to think what are the consequences. So we are always talking about increasing biodiversity, increasing the organic matter on our soil, increasing the life on the soil. When we increase 1% of organic matter in our soil, it means we draw down 20 tons. If we increase 1% one, 1 of organic matter in one hectare, 20 tons of carbon from the air. We have a problem with climate change, so if we think about that, the, the agriculture can be a solution for our climate change and our climate crisis. At when each 1% increase at the organic matter in the soil, we also had more, I think, 1,050, no, 150,000 liters per hectare more holding capacity of water in our soil. So, we have a problem with rain, we have a problem with carbon on the air. What's the solution? For sure, regenerative agriculture. We will try to integrate the, the cattle in our system. It will be the last part because we work in the agroforest system. So, and in a small scale, I think it's a little bit more complex. And that would be a question I would do for Bobby. What does he think if we have a a limited scale to do it, if it has to be in a large scale, to be do it with the earth movement. But after all, I think when we talk about these systems, it's always a question of changing our, our thought and philosophy. But we are, because we always have to think, we have to believe in nature, and we have to work with nature and not against her. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point. Thank you, João. You have not commented that the, the picture that you have under uh, here, it's one of your, your uh, yeah, explorations. Yeah, one of our plots, so, so we can see as, our as I know it, I, production. Uh, I don't know if it's the Chile uh, one or yeah, not. It's oh, the, it's the Chile one. <laughs> production in the agroforestry context. Okay, thank you very much. And now uh, for, uh, I, I will have in my panel something really innovative and new. This is there is having someone in person, Daniela. Please present yourself as you are here. <laughs> Give us our comments. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniela Fonseca. I'm from Food for Sustainability. We are a collaborative laboratory, and we work in the front, front, forefront of uh, sustainable intensification of food production and in the interface of health and well-being. So we work in the areas of circular economy, regenerative agriculture, also ecosystem services, entrepreneurship, and functional nutrition. And today I would like to share with you um, a project in which we are working and is very aligned with, uh, with the work that uh, João showed, which uh, concerns regenerative agriculture and taking care of the soil and the land to have better productivity as well as uh, do not compromise soil health. So uh, the project that I will be talking to you is a project in which Food for Sustainability aims to test, assess and develop um, a set of indicators, tools and methods um, to monitor in situ biodiversity across farms with a spatial and temporal distance, let's say, and uh, different farming systems. So, with this perspective, our purpose is to bring together, to evaluate and analyze the traditional methods that we use currently to evaluate biodiversity and also align them with the more modern, let's say, uh, tools and methodologies so we can have a holistic overview of how can we measure biodiversity in an easy to use way, let's say, for, regarding a farmer's um, usage, and at the same time making it affordable. With this, 
we want to address uh, societal cha uh, challenges, let's say. Uh, we, went, uh, we want to make sure that farming systems are able to increase carbon stocks. Uh, we went to, want to make sure that with these uh, farming practices, uh, we are working towards ecosystem services delivery, food services, and also food safety, as well as soil and water management. So, uh, with this in mind, our purpose is to align these indicators and uh, this framework of management with the current uh, common agricultural policy as well as the biodiversity plans so that in the future we can have a set of guidelines that can be provided uh, to farmers so that they can use them to evaluate above and below ground biodiversity and also to facilitate the use of these indicators in uh, green financing. Because we know that in the future we will probably evaluate and finance farmers by how much carbon they can stock. So it is also important for us to guarantee that along with carbon that we take care of the soil because if we have microorganisms, insects, pollinators and so on, we have a rich um, environment and it is healthier and at the same time it collaborates and cooperates to the, to the purpose of the current strategies that we witness from the Green Deal to the biodiversity plans and many, many other actions that we have, main, uh, let's say for example the farm to fork and so on. So I hope you uh, enjoy my uh, the mm -hmm. share of my experience and this is the work of Food for Sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, Bobby, please, I, I, will, uh, I will raise a, a question to you because one of my favorite quotes, the uh, last favorite quotes, it's about uh, a project and a, a study that you, uh, you perform on, uh, at Savory Institute. Uh, and uh, it says that uh, it's not the cow, it's the how. Please uh, comment. Uh, what, uh, what you want to, 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 to say to us regarding the, the kind of preju preju prejudice that we have when we look at the, the, the issues. Yeah, so uh, it's not the cow is the how is uh, the name of a, of a TEDx talk that I gave. So you, know, you can Google my name and that and it'll come up where I go at this uh, in depth. But ultimately what I'm getting at there is you know, livestock have been vilified all across the globe and people, um, you know, have very strong feelings against livestock. Um, I think it originally started with people um, believing that livestock were degrading landscapes and so we needed to get rid of them. Um, that then morphed into nutritional uh, debates about the merits of eating meat and then more recently um, that has merged to a uh, discussion about the climate impact as it relates to greenhouse gas emissions relating from livestock. Um, and I think where all of these issues arise is from the industrial management of our agricultural systems. So when livestock are taken off of green pastures and put into feedlots, um, the environmental outcomes are horrendous. The, the health outcomes are nowhere near as if they were on grass. The greenhouse gas emissions that arise from those manure lagoons that exist because they are kept tightly bunched in this pen as opposed to out on a pasture where their manure can cycle through the the soil and create new soil organic matter and create life it's just leaching methane out of these manure lagoons so a lot of the arguments against cattle are valid in the specific situation of industrialized animal agriculture but what people don't often see is that that industrial approach to animal agriculture is not the only option. What we're doing at the Savory Institute is an alternative to that. And so we have been kind of fed this narrative that the that we have a choice between plants or animals and that they are at odds against one another. And I think that really is a sleight of hand that has been very skillfully 
um, crafted and deployed by corporate interests so that you can say, okay, stop eating meat. Instead, eat this impossible burger, which is made from genetically modified soy, which is just as bad for the environment. Um, and I think what the narrative should be instead of plants versus animals is rather looking at the industrialization of agriculture and then comparing that to a regenerative approach towards agriculture because you can industrialize animals and you can industrialize plants you can have huge monocultures of corn soy wheat whatever it may be um, and then on the flip side of things you can have regenerative agriculture as it relates to animals, as it relates to plants. It doesn't have to be plants versus animals. The conversation should really be industrial and regenerative, and which one do we want more of? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bobby. And, and, uh, and thank you also for having us at your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. If I, can I just add one point on Bobby's great presentation and, and, and that, that the, the issue about meat? Please, please go ahead. So not, not only is uh, industrial uh, soy bad for the environment, it actually, um, you know, by turning the grasslands, which are perennial complex organisms, into annual croplands, we have turned the second largest carbon sink, which is the grasslands, into a carbon source. And, and particularly in areas where there isn't the lush amount of wa water that's obviously sitting behind you, uh, Yao, if, I, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The grasslands generally are brittle, dry areas. And without the symbiotic right relationship between large herbivores moving in herds and the grasslands, those grasslands degrade and, be, and essentially release carbon. So it's, it's not only that it's bad for the environment to grow monocultures of soy, it's actually contributing to climate change. And it's the, the analogy, you know, it's, it's like someone was saying earlier, the, the, the bio, biodiversity thing happens slowly. We, we, we are very conscious about tearing down the Amazon now to grow soy to feed the cattle, but we accept that we've torn down the world's grasslands to grow soy to, to feed cattle, which is probably just as bad from a climate change point of view as it is to tear down the Amazon right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And John, on that Amazon point, if you look at the numbers of soy production in the Amazon, for example, um, yes, some of it is going to feed cattle. Um, a significant portion of it is actually going to China to feed hogs. Um, and so livestock, you know, cattle get the bad rap. But when you look at the numbers, they are not actually the main driver of what is causing that there. Um, there's also policy aspects of um, what's going on in Brazil in terms of the, the two-year period that the land um, can't be cropped. So it essentially incentivizes uh, producers to cut down forest, um, grow soy and then you know move it over to livestock production it's um there's there's an aspect of the policies in place in brazil that are really driving those decisions to be made and so if um you know we were looking to enact change there that would be one lever to pull okay thank you João. do you have any comment i'll just add one thing like bobby says it's not the cow it's the how we also have that sentence would usually say some numbers or some names of trees before the cow because the cow rhymes with the house, so it finishes well. But mm -hmm. we also say the same about the eucalyptus or every hateful tree we have, and some people point the finger, and in fact, it's always the management. It's not the tree, it's not the plant, it's not the animal, it's always the human management, so yeah. It's always, there is always a different type of manner to do things and we always can do it in the right way. We just have to believe it and do the effort. Okay. Daniela, you have the privilege. Do I? Thank you so much. So maybe I, I can uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. And just like uh, João said, uh, it is important for us to make sure that we adopt these practices and look at them as a need and not as a long-term 
solution. We should uh, look into these practices and start working on them right now. We can see uh, that uh, usually policies, they predict that we should do something, but the incentives or the way in which, in which we do it, we uh, take so much time to implement new systems and new ways of doing things, or let's just say to reinvent what we do. Uh, we should uh, do a little bit more. Uh, someone said earlier, we should uh, make sure that we do not do less bad. We should definitely do more, uh, work towards gener gener regeneration and make sure that in the future, we are not, um, let's say, uh, starting a deforestation because there's some big company behind that. We should uh, look inside, look in the long term, make sure that we are not disrupting the ecosystem because after all, ecosystem services, we are paying for that even though we do not notice it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, João. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you.